All right. All righty, I'm letting everybody in. Rock and roll. Well, I know Dan's going to be here. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Hello. Welcome, welcome. I think this is going to be a hot one because uh, the, the wines are pretty awesome. And I know everybody loves their, their Italians. They're Italians. I tell you. Well, they did all kinds of things for a piece of Now, these children aren't angels, but they said, oh, they need to be on a, um, on a schedule. Well, they're scheduled. I'm schedule. just going to randomly <laughs> mute people. Uh, no offense meant. And all of their medical records, they all have us Unmute <laughs> yourselves if you uh, do want to talk. You know, you know, this is a pretty fo pretty open forum, so you can always uh, unmute your mic and ask questions. But I'm just randomly muting here to like kind of cal calm the uh, noise down a little bit. Welcome, good to see you guys. And uh, this is the first one of the year that we're doing with some sunlight uh, still going <laughs> in the background, at least for me here on the East Coast. Yay. Mm. I hope this uh we find you well and in good spirits and ready to drink some awesome Brunellos. Scott, I know Scott was on top of this, man. I knew you weren't gonna miss this. <laughs> Hello. How you doing, man? I'm great. Ready to awesome. go. Yeah, I assume uh some of you guys probably tasted these wines already. Um I opened mine up yesterday, and uh, they are drinking beautifully. Hi, Nick and Risa. Good to see you guys. I haven't seen you in a couple. Uh, Dan and George. How have you been, Mark? Good, Mark. good. Mark. Hey, guys. I've been really good. Good. Great. Yeah, um, we missed some of you uh, last week. I was in Mercersburg, Central Pennsylvania. We did a bed. Oh, and I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was um, another nice group. We had about fourteen people, and it was beautiful because the weather's just starting to turn nice, and uh, you can get mm -hmm. get a chance to get out into the countryside and, and take some road trips and everything. So, yeah, it was wonderful. Couldn't 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 have been as good without us, though. No, <laughs> it never you is. You forgot to add that point. I don't tell everybody that because they might get offended, but yeah, <laughs> I always find myself oh, just sort of pining nice a little bit for, for Nick and Risa. Yeah. Hey, Fred, how you doing? Todd. Well, thanks. Terry got Glenn. The... Mark, I got the glass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Todd, where you at? I can't. Um... Over the corner. I don't know. For me, I'm in the corner. <laughs> you might be or we have two uh pages here where are you at oh there you are yeah you're on page two i'm sorry yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so todd and stacy joined us last week um for the wine weekend we were up in mercersburg central pennsylvania and uh i always do like a little bit of trivia and some prize giveaways and they were the um the lucky winners of two really nice uh sets of uh zweisel wine glasses how, are you enjoying them? Yeah, yeah, they're nice. We yeah. love them. Cool. Being part of this crew makes it easier to win the trivery, though. Anybody, <laughs> anybody thinking of going? Yeah, you did kind of have a, have a little bit of an edge there, <laughs> but only on one on one question. To be fair, right. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm also uh, using those today too. Got mine. Cool. All right, so we got a little bit of a late start here, but it seems like we're settled in, and you know we have a nice size group. Um, it's warming up. I, spirits are warming up and we have some really great wines tonight. I know people get really excited about uh, these bold red wines. So tonight we are drinking Brunellos and it goes without saying, if you haven't already, please open your bottles of wine. Uh, I hope you started them a couple hours early if possible. And that way you got them breathing and aerating so that they really start to open up and express their best. Um, the order that we're going to go in tonight there's only two, so this is not going to be a long night, unless you want it to be. And uh, we're going to start with the 2018, and we're going to go to the 2017. So we're going young to old, I guess, if that's what you want to call it. 
Um, these are relatively young for Brunellos, and um, they're right in the sweet spot now. Brunellos typically take, traditionally take a long time to uh, age and to really come around uh, because they're they're so tannic. The grape is very tannic. So they need a couple of years to really kind of soften up. So right now, at uh, six and five years, or six and seven years, excuse me, um, we are getting right into the window of, of great drinking. And uh, I've had mine open for a day now, and they're beautiful. So uh, without further ado, uh, do we have any questions that you guys want to hear discussed or, or topics that you want me to, to talk about tonight or to cover before we begin? Uh, so Mark, can you, if you can just explain where the name Brunello came from? Oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna cover that almost right away. Okay, great. Um, yeah, a good, it's a good question. Uh, anything else? And also, by the way, too, uh, you feel free to use the chat. That's uh, another feature if you just don't uh, wanna be heard, or if you don't wanna be uh, speaking directly to me, um, we can use the chat and Brianna will field those questions to me. And we also have Ed on, online here with us too. Oh. Is to, the in-house expert over at WTSO. He knows quite a bit about his wine too. So um, we got a couple of experts in the room tonight that you can sound off. Mark, Mark, can you also comment on, I was a little surprised in your video when you said open it up up to two days before mm -hmm. drinking it. Um, so can you comment a little bit on you know, how you know that? I mean, is, is it specific to this grape or you know how, how you know to decant and uh, open well, up that far in advance. Yeah, sure, sure. I can I can address that right away because it only take a second. Um, Brunellos are are very well known for being uh, tannic wines. Uh, the grape is very tannic; it has thick skin, um, and it usually needs a, a, anywhere from five to ten years to really kind of soften up. Uh, and one way you can really help that out, we're kind of on the cusp, like I was saying. So we're just entering the drinking window right now where you, you want to open these up and you can enjoy them. Uh, any younger than this, I would be a little hesitant. They'd be really tannic, uh, really harsh and bitter. Uh, so they're just on the cusp of being ready to drink and uh, a little aerating, a lot of aerating actually will help to soften those tannins a lot. So um, yeah, with, with something as tannic as this, uh, you can do it with a, Bar a Barolo as well, because Barolos can be very tannic. And also Cabernet Sauvignon, too, uh, can be very tannic. Uh, you would you can give them two days. So, you know, open them up. Uh, just pour a little bit out into your glass to get some airspace into that bottle and then put your cork back in. And really, you've done your work. So you've done the, the uh, homework of getting that aerated and mixed up. And, yeah, they can take two days. I think... Um, we have a guy on here. I don't know if he's with us tonight, but he does uh, a three-day wine review. And he he has a blog where he reviews the wines over the course of three days and talks about how they change. And usually the takeaway is by day three, uh, they're even better. So wines like this that are really high in tannins tend to soften up and to get even better with more time. So yeah, two days is a safe window. As far as where I'm laying this down. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mark. I haven't been here in a while. I know. Are you drinking your wine tonight? Yes. And we opened <laughs> the right one, the uh, 2018. Oh, okay. So you're just going to do one with us tonight. You're see, you're hoarding the other well, one. Well, the I night see. is young. The night wow. is young. <laughs> well, no, I don't I, blame I you. I wanted to ask a question. Yeah, and sure. it always, for me, is the first question because I hate to just drink without nibbling on something. What is a good nibble with something like this? Do you have any hard cheese in the house? I do. Yeah, yeah. If you have like something hard, you typically they recommend like a pecorino with this. But if you don't have a pecorino, you can go with another uh, hard aged cheese and it'll be perfect. Okay. Does that work? We did aerate it quite a bit before we poured the glasses. Nice, nice. Okay. Well, you did it. You did well then. Okay. So uh, let's uh, get started then. And. Um, you know, I always like to kind of like share the origins of this grape. And we're going to share my screen real quick and I'm going to show you. Let me get rid of this browser first. So Brunello di Montalcino, does anybody have any guesses um, as to the naming of that wine, where the name comes from? Uh, 
Okay, well, this is relatively common in Italian wine vernacular, uh, the nomenclature. Uh, this is what we call a grape from a place. And this is very common when it comes to Italian wine. Uh, they, name it they name the wine after the grape that it's made from and also the place where it's made. Brunello di Montalcino. Brunello is the grape and Montalcino is the place where it comes from. So let me show you real quick. where we're at. And we've been to uh, Brunello a couple of times in premium wine clubs, so you probably know this already, but it's in Tuscany. And it's about 16 miles as the crow flies southeast of Siena, of the city of Siena. Very close to the, uh, the coastline here. And if you've been to Tuscany before, you know that these are rolling foothills that can range anywhere from, uh, you know, zero feet above sea level to about 500 feet above sea level. And this here, is the small hillside fortification of Montalcino. So that's the town. It's a very small city it's, or a town, I guess. Um, it's only 5,000 people in total population. And um, it was a fortification in medieval times, like many of them were. They built it on top of a hill for uh, strategic and for safety reasons. Um, and the vineyards kind of sprawl out around this. Now there are 8,000 uh, square acres, excuse me, of vineyards in total in this region, but only about 5,000, maybe 4,700 in total are dedicated to the Brunello grape. Uh, and here are our two wineries tonight. So this is uh, Montosoli. This is, that's going to be the uh, Celestino Pecci. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, the Gode. And um, this right here is Pecci Celestino. So they're not very far from each other, probably maybe only like five miles at most. And uh, all these vineyards are concentrated in this region. And uh, this is probably the warmest climate in all of Tuscany. It averages anywhere from about 50 degrees in the, uh, the spring to about 95 degrees in the summertime around July and August. So it gets a little hot there, um, but there is a cooling effect that comes from the ocean over here. Uh, you can see there's relatively, there's some river beds and some channels where the uh, cold air can channel through. Yeah. And uh, so you get this dynamic that we it's talk about all the time in the wine world, where you have these hot days and you have these cool nights. And that's really great for growing grapes because it ripens the grapes during the day and at night it allows them to go dormant and rest. Um, so that's what makes this particular region perfect for that, uh, for growing grapes. Um, the Brunello grape is actually the Sangiovese grape. So for those of you who are very familiar with Chianti and from with Tuscan wines, uh, Sangiovese is the prime grape used in most wines in this region. Um, in the 1800s, there was uh, a family, which some of you may be familiar with, the uh, Biondi Santi family. Um, they are very famous in the wine world and responsible for pretty much inventing Brunello di Montalcino. And... Uh, they were discovering mutations of this grape and they found that one in particular was well suited to making wine. Uh, so they named that particular um, mutation of the grape Brunello. And Brunello actually is derivative of the word brune in France, uh, which is brown. So Stacy, you were asking me where the name comes from. Uh, the grape itself is actually kind of got a little bit of a brown tint to it. And Bruno or Brune in France means brown. So Brunello means little dark one or little brown one. Uh, so I'll show you a picture of the grape real quick. And you can see for yourself, it's got a little bit of brown tint to it. So that's where it gets the name Brunello. And now you know where Montalcino is. Uh, this is the gentleman who uh, kind of invented the, the grape, I guess, or invented the wine for better lack of better words. Um, this is Ferrucci Biondi Santi. And he is the gentleman who in 1860s uh, cultivated this one particular uh, uh, mutation of the Sangiovese grape and 
they were the first people, his family, the Beyond Santi family were the first people to put the name Brunello de Montalcino on the bottle. Uh, so it's interesting in the first 57 years that they were making this wine, uh, they were kind of experimenting and trying to figure it all out. So at the time, they weren't proud enough to put it out to the public. So they only um, declared four vintages. In 57 years, there were only four vintages in total. So this is a relatively young grape because it wasn't until the 1960s that it really started to take off. Um, here's a picture real quick. This is the town of Montalcino or the city, the fortification on top of the hill. Uh, has anybody in the group been here? No, it looks beautiful. I've been to Tuscany before, but I haven't been this far south. Uh, a lot of Tuscany looks like this, um, but this is, uh, I would love to go there one day. What did you, what did you call the hill again? Oh, it's just Montalcino. It's a fortification. It used to be, um, it, it was a fortress or a fort. It was in, you know, an enclosed city. You see the wall around it. This is very typical in medieval times. They build on top of the hills to, to protect the uh, people. And uh, usually there were moats or gates around there so that invaders couldn't come in. That's a very pr uh, familiar scene in medieval Europe. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay. Let's uh, stop the screen share here and we'll get to the rest of it and start drinking. So, Mark, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Brunello is specific to Montalcino. It's not, it's not, you couldn't get a Brunello from any other area of Italy. Uh, no. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's indigenous to that region or it's, it's uh, specific to that region. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, it's interesting for the longest time, you know, I mentioned that this really wasn't, it didn't take off until the 1960s. Um, so before then, they were making a white sweet wine there. Um, it was called Muscadello. I don't know if anybody here has ever had that before. Um, I know they probably still make it. Nick, you're shaking your head. Yes. Uh, you've had it before? Yeah. Yeah, a long time ago. I can't tell you anything more than that. So I do remember having it, though. Yeah. Uh, you don't remember if it was any good yeah. or no? <laughs> no. Well, that was the thing. It was kind of an unremarkable sweet white wine that they were making there for centuries. And um, the Biondi Santi family was kind of experimenting with this Brunello grape until the 1960s. Um, and then around that period in time, uh, the Italian wine company, Bonfi, which you're probably very well familiar with, um, they were an Italian-American company. Uh, Bonfi moved into the region and started to buy up land. And they had an idea to make a sparkling Moscadello. Uh, so they were going to go with the white sparkling sweet wine at first, and it failed miserably. Uh, so they did not do well selling this particular wine, this sweet sparkling Moscadello. Uh, so they started looking at this Brunello grape and investing in that and planting that instead. And uh, it was Bonfi that was really responsible for kind of like kickstarting uh, the Brunello revolution in the 1970s. Uh, so that's how that all began. Uh, so when we say it's a relatively young grape uh, and wine, it's relatively young compared to the rest of Italian history. Mark, is the um, Muscadello made with Muscadine grapes? Yes. We, that's uh, the primary Oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Not Muscadine, uh, Muscat, which is a different. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the Muscat family is very, very, uh, there's probably like 200 different types of Muscat grapes oh. out there. And I think only about five of them in, in total are really good for making wine out of. Uh, right. Number one is uh, Muscato Bianco, which is the one that they make um, like Asti Spumanti out of. So when you see high-end sparkling wines, uh, Spumantes from the northern part of Italy that are sweet, uh, those are usually made from Muscato Bianco. Uh, and I think that's the same grape that they use in Muscadello too. Okay, nice. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. Okay. Just looking through the chat real quick here. Um, I'm, I know, Bree, you probably tell me if there were anything uh, important. I'm not a cup too. You're good. But um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're all good. Cool. 
So uh, let's talk about these wines then. Um, these are typically very expensive <laughs> wines because most of the time they're being hand harvested. Um, all the man, all the labor's manual, uh, the pressing and everything like that is uh, done over an extended period of time. Um, when they crush the grapes, they let them sit for anywhere from 20 to 50 days sometimes to get the color out of the skins. That's why they have so much tannic, uh, you know, tannins in them. And they can be very astringent and very strong and they need a long time to age. Uh, traditionally, they wouldn't age them in um, oak the way they do in France. So they're not, they're not aging them in new oak where you're going to get some of that oak flavor. Uh, these wines are so tannic as it is, they don't need any additional tannins coming from the oak barrels. Uh, so in the past, they've used anything from walnut to chestnut and uh, neutral barrels from Slovenia too. So uh, some of you may know that um, most of the oak in the world comes from the United States and from France, but uh, Slovenia and Hungary actually produced quite a fair share of oak as well too. So um, this wine in particular, traditionally aged in Slovenian, Slovenian oak, that's a mouthful. All right. That's it. Uh, I know usually it seems a lot longer than that, but let's get to the drinking part. Let's get to the fun part. So as I said, we're going to start with the younger one, 2018 first. Uh, right. we're gonna, that's the uh, Le Golde. Hi. You want this guy here. Hmm? Yeah. The 2018 vintage. You know, oftentimes I'll re refer to uh, Wine Spectator's vintage chart. That's free for everybody to use. So if you go to winespectator.com, they have vintage charts there. And this is different than a vintage rating. So um, certain wines will come with like a 90 point rating or a 95 point rating for that particular wine. Uh, but Wine Spectator, Spectator also rates vintages too. So the, the uh, 2018 vintage, they rated 93 points um, and they have it listed as drink or hold which is kind of what we were talking about earlier. This is either kind of like you can drink it now if you want to, but you could probably hold it as well and it'll age some more and it'll probably improve even more. Uh, but 93 points is pretty good for a vintage rating. Uh, it was apparently a rainy spring and uh, they had storms early in the season. So uh, when you have rain, it causes the berries to swell up with water and the flavors get diluted. So that can cause a lot of worry for winemakers. Um, but then they, they, they Cooler weather moved in around September, and that caused the uh, ripening to end perfectly. Uh, so they had really sort of aromatic, elegant wines, and I think that's what we're going to find here. This um, particular uh, winery here, Azienda Legode. They have uh, been family owned since the 1960s, and they were making wine before, but they didn't declare their first vintage of Brunello until 1995. So very young as far as Italian wine is concerned. This is a bigger one. This is 15.5% alcohol. Uh, what are you guys getting on the nose here? For we me, it's all... Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I'm sorry. We have our first comment saying it's very tannic. Okay, so somebody... Yeah, you're at the, the, the drinking part. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be... These are tannic wines. Uh, and that is kind of par for the course when it comes to Brunello. That grape first, is very thin. First nose I, I got was something like cinnamon or something like that. Yeah, something yeah. Explosive. A little chocolatey too, maybe, right? Like yes. a, almost like dusted cocoa. And it's very good with chocolate. <laughs> I, I would imagine so. Um, on some, yeah. It's also got, for me personally, I get a cherry note, a I cherry just, watery. I was just going to say that it almost, it's like um, cherry water ice or like, it's like a little candied almost. Yeah, that's good, Michelle. I'm learning. <laughs> hmm. A little leather. Yeah, leather, leather, definitely. Leather and spice. Yeah. Yeah. All, all true. And We're having more... chocolate with this, so it's really, so I'm smelling the chocolate. I wasn't sure if it was from the wine or from the chocolate itself. <laughs> yeah, they, um, you know, I was looking at Bonfi's website earlier for uh, their suggestions on food pairings, and they said typically you don't do Brunello with desserts. 
Uh, it was very Italian because they're very opinionated about the way things are. They have to go <laughs> this way. You don't do Brunello with a, with a dessert. But um, they said, if you are going to have it with desserts, typically biscuits uh, are yeah, it's chocolate biscuits for some reason. The acidity is high. It's very tannic. The acidity, as we know, is what makes it a very food friendly wine. Acids work well with fats. So this will work well with very fatty cuts of meat, um, stews, soups. Cream, uh, the Bonfi website was suggesting cream sauces as well. I could see like a rosé sauce. But yes, uh, Dan and Georgian, you guys are, yeah, you called out that it's very tannic. I'm sorry, Dan and Georgian, you know, like I think I met your friend before, but maybe I forgot her name. Could Donna. you please introduce? That's Donna. She Donna. was a... In Marcus Burger with the one we've done. Yeah, you're right. And I'm sorry, yeah. I forgot your name, Don. I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget you. That's okay. No problem. <laughs> Are you drinking? I'm <clears throat> Am I my what? Are you drinking the wines too? Yeah, we all oh, yeah. have the first <laughs> bottle. All right, all right. Glass is empty. All right, I'm trying. I'm watching you. I was going to say we had some with dinner. We paired it with the uh, mushroom bolognese that uh, that you had a, a couple years ago. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, that would be perfect. Um, yeah, root vegetables in mushrooms and truffles are perfect yeah. with wines like these. Yeah, as a matter yeah. of fact, you could even do pizza. And if you wanted to do a pizza, you could do a mushroom or a truffle pizza. Mm. Like if you wanted to kind of like you know. And I, if, ironically, Mark. I mean, you know me. I don't like real tannic wines and stuff. But the mushroom bolognese has the fresh red pepper in it, right? And I can't do too much of that because of the acid reflux. But the, this wine actually took that bite out. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, usually it's the other way around. You know, the acids in the wine really kind of like, um, you know, mix with the fats and in the food. Mm -mm. No. But you're, you're saying it was the opposite for you, huh? It was the opposite. Yeah. Now I didn't put like your mushroom bolognese call for a half a teaspoon of crushed red pepper. I only put a fourth yeah. in there because I'm so sensitive to it. Um, yeah. But when I tried a little bit of the, the mushroom bolognese with like after I was cleaning up, it really had a bite to me. So it's almost like the wine kind of muted it yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that that vegetarian bolognese like has gone far. Um, I love that recipe. It's just so complicated, and it can get very expensive too. Um, the porcini mushrooms can be really expensive sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, yeah, I have a recipe that I share usually with my wine groups, and it's a vegetarian uh, bolognese, and it uses a lot of mushrooms as the base. But the magic ingredient in that is it's a, a powdered mixture that you make from toasted fennel seed, red pepper flakes, and I forget what the third ingredient is at this point. I think coriander, and you put them in a more, oh no, it's bay leaf. So it's bay leaf, red pepper, and fennel seed, and you toast them on a skillet, and then you put them in a mortar and pestle, and you grind them into a powder. And oh my God, that is so good with red wines like this. It's perfect. Um, I actually don't even, I use that in other recipes and other foods that I make. I keep a little thing of it up in our pantry. And uh, that's like my my magic pixie dust. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, this is a beautiful wine. It's changing in the glass as we're going along. I'm finding that more of that fruit and the cherry is kind of coming out now at this point. Um, and also something that we didn't call out in the beginning, I'm getting some pepper on there. So a little bit of a spicy nose on the finish and some flowers too. Almost like rose petals. But that's a hallmark of a really high quality wine. It's just going to keep changing in the glass as we go along. Um, you know, we'll go back to it after we taste the second one, and it'll probably <laughs> seem completely different by then. Cool. And um, if I didn't mention this before, the um, standard in Brunello, you know, these are DOCG wines, uh, Denominatia. Denominazione de origine controllata e garantita. So that is a standard quality that Italian wine regions are 
held to. And there's two categories. There's just a DOC and a DOCG. DOCG is the highest standard quality that they have in the country. And uh, in order for that to be certified and guaranteed, uh, they have to pass different lab tests. They have to adhere to all the rules and standards of that region on making the wine, um, tons per acre, the way the wine is crushed and, and uh, vinified, and how it's stored and aged as well, too. Uh, so for Brunello de Montalcino, the rule is that it has to spend at least two years in an oak cask. It can be neutral oak, but it has to spend at least two years in the cask. And it has to spend four years in total uh, in the cask and aging in the cellar before they can actually release it. So very uh, time intensive and costly wine to make, which is why most of them are so expensive. Um, this one here in particular was uh, aged in Slavonian oak. We were talking about Slavonian oak. So this one was for 35 uh, months, excuse me. So almost three years in oak. Um, and then another six to seven months in the bottle. And that would explain why there's some tannins in there as well too. Okay, do we have any questions or thoughts on this one before we move to the next one? Oh man, the tannins are getting grippier and grippier. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, they're you know they're not letting go. This is uh, one of the best wines you've shared with us. I want to say this wow. really is. I think it's outstanding. It's phenomenal. I, I agree with you too, Robert. Yeah. Um, you know, when I just tasted these, I always taste the five minutes before I get on just to see where everything is. And uh, yeah, I, that was a winner as soon as I tasted that. I couldn't wait to share that with you guys. <laughs> hey, Mark, can you talk at some point, I think if this applies to both wines, is just that over time, the color changes a bit and mm -hmm. you know, gets browner and why that's good or, or bad. Um, or it doesn't matter. Well, yes, yeah, Fred, I can definitely talk to that. Is Lisa there with you, by the way? Yeah. Yes. Oh, hi. Hiding hi. on us again, are you? Yes, she's hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, um, we, we discussed early in the beginning, uh, oh, sorry, in the beginning of this, uh, we discussed where the name comes from, Brunello. So the grape itself has a bit of a brown tint to it. So you're going to get some of that color in the wine to begin with. Um, the way the Italians produce their wine, uh, a lot of the wines are tend to be, um, they don't spend a lot of time macerating on the skins. So you're not going to get a lot of color in, in them. So they tend to be, you see sort of how this wine has this translucent color to it. Um, it's almost like the it's got the, uh, the transparency of like a Pinot Noir. You can see through it in the glass. Uh, so that means that it's got fewer antioxidants and a few like less extract in the grape. So it's going to oxidize a lot faster. Uh, this is very typical for Italian wines. And uh, when you're, you're, Studying like I did through the WSET and you're assessing the wine based on its color. Uh, one of the giveaways that you might have an Italian wine in your glass is that it's usually going to be very clear like this. You can almost see through it. And the other giveaway is that it's going to have a sort of brownish tint to it. Uh, and if you turn it sideways, I don't know if you have a white tablecloth or if you have a white napkin in front of you. But if you turn it sideways, um, the edge of the wine is sort of orange or almost brown. So almost like that's Yes, yeah, but it has sort of two or three different colors to it. So if you turn it sideways and kind of like tilt and look through the meniscus of the glass, the uh, wine, you can see that the body of the wine is almost like a garnet color, and then it's turning orange as it gets towards the rim, and then you have a watery edge on that rim. Mm -hmm. uh, that watery rim, that very, very last part of the edge where it's turning watery is usually what you look at when you're looking at the age of the wine. Uh, the older the wine gets, the more the particles are starting to separate out of the wine. So that rim gets bigger and bigger as the wine gets older. Um, so if you can visualize a red wine is nothing more than water with a bunch of like part of colored particles floating in it. And those are all bits and pieces of the grapes that were crushed. Uh, so over time, gravity is going to do its magic, work its magic, and also um, ionic charges. And there are some other science scientific terms that uh, are above my pay grade, 
Um, but particles are charging and they're, they're attracting each other. They're clumping, they're falling down to the bottom of the bottle, which is why you get deposits and also uh, why the concentration of color fades as the wine gets older and you start to get that watery rim on the edge too. Uh, and likewise, oxygen is doing its working on the uh, wine and oxidizing it. And as it does that, it's also uh, changing the color of it. So it's going from a bright red to more of like a brick red and eventually a brown. Uh, so that's a good way to tell the age of a wine too. And the fewer antioxidants that you have in a particular grape, for example, Brunello, doesn't not very high in antioxidants, it'll oxidize a lot faster. So this one's going to turn brown a lot faster than say a Cabernet Sauvignon of the same age. Mark, you didn't mention any change in the taste over... Oh, well, uh, yeah, if you want me to, I can. I mean, uh, yeah, as, as the wine polymerizes and oxygenates, um, oxidizes, um, all those fresh fruit flavors that you get out of a fresh grape eventually start to yield these flavors that you see in dried fruits, for example, dried frig, dried figs, dried apricots, dried plums, uh, depending whether you're drinking a red or white wine. And uh, the tannins uh, soften. So there's, um, gosh, I'm not a scientist, so please forgive me if we have anybody in the group uh, if you can explain it better than I can, but uh, tannins are proteins and apparently they're chains. So they're made of molecules that are chained together. And uh, as the tannins age in the wine, the ends of the chains, the molecules that are on the ends of the chain fall off. Uh, so to the tongue, a young tannin, like a completely, uh, a complete tannic strand is actually harsh to the tongue. And it tastes very bitter and very astringent. But over time, as the ends and the particles fall off of that strand, that protein strand, it tends to start to taste softer to the tongue. And that's why we use the term round. So a wine becomes more round as it gets older, because it literally is changing the shape of the uh, tannic protein strain um, to from a, a square or like a harsh cornered protein molecule to a rounded one. So that's where we get the term round. Yeah, sorry. I know I'm stumbling my way through this. I'm not a scientist, but um, that's. I think that's helpful. And and um, this change doesn't necessarily mean the taste is bad or that the wine is bad or it's oh we waited too long to drink it. Um, I mean, it, at some point, I guess it it could, right? But but yeah, yeah there is a change. point. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Um, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. I just the the color changes right and and the characteristics a, a little bit, but um, that doesn't mean it's it um, you no longer like the taste or, or or whatever. It's still it may be a slightly different taste, but it's because it's rounder and 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 so forth. But um, looking at the color, you might say, well, this is this wine is too old or it's bad or something. But that's not necessarily true. No, no, I am, um, and it it. I sometimes liken it to uh, being a human being and, you know, being young and rambunctious and kind of uh, reckless when you're younger. And then you go through your teen years and you mature a little bit and eventually you become an adult and you grow up and you have a different sense of understanding about the world around you, um, you know, and your tastes change as well, too. So what you thought was great when you were you know, 10 years old is not necessarily the way you see the world when you're 30 years old or 40 or 50, as it were. Uh, so drinking a wine that ages is the same thing too. You sort of have to shift your paradigm. You can't think of it like in terms of like fresh fruit and this is gonna be like eating a piece of candy and this is gonna burst in my mouth and it's gonna be um, like, you know, eating a cherry pie or like dessert. It's, um you know, it, it's a shift in paradigm. You have to start thinking about uh, more kind of complex and interesting flavors that you come across in your wisdom and your time here on earth. Uh, things like earth and, uh, you know, wet leaves and the changes of the seasons bring along all these different smells and flavors. Uh, the smell of smoke wafting in the air, you know, as somebody's burning their leaves off in the distance in the fall. Um, the taste of umami or like things that are savory. Uh, soy sauce, Worcestershire sauce, you know, stuff that are Worcester, Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> <laughs> however you pronounce that damn wet word um you know but the things that you didn't necessarily find appealing when you were young and you know sort of like lacking an understanding of the world uh become appealing to you as you gain more wisdom in life 
And I think that's the same approach that you take when you're looking at an older wine too. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be like uh, like a roller coaster ride in an amusement park. It's more like kind of like a slow drive through the woods on a Sunday. <laughs> um, Mark, I apologize because my computer connection went out. So maybe you've covered this, but for these two particular wines, what is the aging potential? Oh, well, you know, it's always a guess at best, but for wines like these that are really strong in tannins, they're higher in alcohol, um, they have good acidity to them too. Those are sort of like the pillars of that you look for when it comes to a wine that's ageable. So wines like these, I would say easily go for another 10 years, maybe even 15. Okay. Yeah. They yeah, won't they last be... that long. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, Mark, like we, we, have, were... uh, we have some comments. Yes, um, yeah. So uh, Dave Dency wants to know what causes the barnyard taste. Um, France. Oh man. You know, I, I the name of the chemical escapes me right now at this point, but uh, I believe it's a terpene. Again, I'm not a scientist, but uh, it's something, it's a chemical compound called a terpene. And as it breaks down in the wine bottle, it gives off this kind of like, um, almost like a musky aroma. Uh, so if you grew up on, on or around a farm, like I did when I was a kid, you kind of get, I sort of grew to like that smell of like cow manure and like the farm. Uh, but that comes out in certain types of wine and certain grapes are stronger in those terpenes than others. Syrah is probably the, the most notorious for that smell. Uh, as Syrah, French Syrah gets old, it really takes on that funky nose to it. Uh, but yeah, this grape, uh, Brunello probably has a little bit of those terpenes in it too. And um, they manifest themselves, as the wine ages, they manifest themselves sometimes as leather, tobacco. Uh, we were talking about forest floor and earth, dirt. And uh, yeah, sometimes that barnyard smell too. I particularly, I happen to like that. I know some people find that off-putting. What do you think? Do you want to move on to the next wine, or, or uh, you, do you still have any more questions you want to talk about? Uh, Scott said uh, he was getting a slight wood or sawdust smell at first. He said it's opening a lot now, and there's more leather and earthiness. Mm -hmm. um, and then Michelle said, uh, so this is the wine for me, because I'm sure going through the <laughs> um, <laughs> maturation process. <laughs> yeah, well, Robert, I think Robert summed it up pretty well. Like tannins, we get a lot rounder as we age. Yes. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully uh, somebody still finds this delicious, I guess. I don't know. Even in our, our round years. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That's this actually, one seems, all... Yeah. This one seems a little softer than the first one on the finish. Are you on uh, number two? Mm -hmm. I guess we need... Yeah, we should probably get there, huh? So let's... Um, everybody... Pour themselves some of that Celestino Pecci, Pecci down. Uh, yeah, there's some softness on the tongue. It still has a really nice finish to it. But there, uh, maybe it's uh, that maybe the tannins aren't as hardy in this one, rounder, as you say. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, well, this one here has one extra year on it. So that could help a little bit uh, to soften <laughs> up some of those tannins. Um, this particular year is uh, 2017. Oh. Wine Spectator gives this 92 points. And they say that it was a warm summer, but very dry. And these are more fragrant wines, apparently. Uh, this winery in particular has been around since 1968. Um, and this is seen 20 days on the skin, so not as long. We were talking about how some of these are a little bit lighter, fewer antioxidants in it. So this is only... Um, they're only crushing it and letting it sit for 20 days before they extract it off of the grapes and then put it into the barrels. And then it sees anywhere from um, 36 to 40 months in, in oak, neutral oak. So this is spending uh, almost three or three plus years in the cask before they put it out to the market. Ooh, so yeah. I'm getting caramel. Yeah, I'm yeah. This one, there. Uh, We, I mean, we may have talked about this before. Has anybody... Uh, have you heard the term malolactic fermentation? Yeah. Yes. So that's another additional process that winemakers can choose to do in 
uh, during the process of making their wines. And it's actually, I think it's a bacteria. It's a bacterial fermentation. And um, it eats the malic acid in the grapes and turns it into lactic acid, which is the, the type of acid that we find in dairy products. Uh, so it actually softens it up a little bit and usually gives us notes of butter in Chardonnay in white wines. And in red wines, it manifests itself as sort of like caramel or butterscotch. So this wine has definitely gone undergone some malolactic fermentation, and it's got a little bit of that like kind of like chocolatey, caramelly kind of thing. Yeah, it almost it, it, if I close my eyes, I can almost imagine like a Werther's original. Ooh. <laughs> Scott said um, he's getting some toasty notes, and he said it's like a tart marshmallow over a fire pit. Yeah, I was yeah. like, ooh. That sounds good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a that's a good call, man. Um, good description too. Yeah, this one's definitely got some of that like Maillard process, that sort of caramelization going on there, and uh, more of a toastiness too. That was not there before when I tasted it earlier. So, um, how long ago before this did you taste it? Um. I opened them two or three hours early and I just took one little sip of each just to get a preview. Um, and then I tasted them both right when we started and I didn't get any of that. Interesting. So it's been, yeah. I, I put it in a decanter though when we started. So maybe some air helped it to open up. Oh, what is that I'm getting? Is it sort of like a dustiness to it? Um, maybe it's just like dusted cocoa. Or coffee, or cola, like cherry cola. Very cool. This one's just a skosh lighter in alcohol. This one's fifteen percent. Um, very well balanced, though. I would say this one's more lean. I don't know if you guys agree. I agree. I I. To me, this is a, a this is my term, a fun wine, because, you know, I like to, when I taste the wine, swish it around my mouth and my gums and all that. And this got this has a lot to it. I mean, there's a lot going on. You feel those tannins and and stuff. Um, and it's not. There's no. There's no way you can call this a dull wine. Yeah, it's a lot more taut and muscular to me. Um, the tannins are are still there, but they they are kind of relaxed a little bit. You know, I'm not sure if it's that year of difference in age, but yeah, there's a little bit of a heat on there too, almost like a spice on the finish. Um, yeah, that's a that's a beautiful for different reasons than the first one. Any thoughts or comments on this on this one in particular? All right, cool. It's very um, different. What's that? It's very different. Yes. They're they're yeah. both excellent. They are. Um I mean, with the I, with the descriptors here, I'm not quite sure. No, I, I let me go back to the first one. I could see an Italian sauce, a grilled Italian sausage with this. This just feels like it needs something really substantial to hold up to it. Well, that's definitely one of the things when I was uh, perusing the Bomfi website earlier, uh, their, their recommendation, generally speaking, was uh, when it comes to Brunello, you can't go with um, with like mild foods. You can't go with anything that's subtle. It has to be intense. Like the food has to match the intensity. Uh, so do not choose delicate dishes when you're, you're pairing Brunello. Uh, you want high tannins like sauces and creams as well. Uh, steaks and meats are pretty obvious. I think they're probably the first thing that comes to mind. Um, another classic is uh, pappardelle and wild boar, cingale as they call it in Italy. Um, that would be perfect, but it's uh, hard to find wild boar around here in the, these parts. <laughs> uh, pecorino cheese, lamb and rosemary is another one that would be awesome too. Um, and then of course we talked about truffles and mushrooms. So if you want to go sophisticated, you could do truffled risotto. But if you want to do something easy and kind of more pedestrian, you could do a, a truffled or a mushroom pizza, and it would probably go just as well. 
Now there's hey, one dish. Yes, yes. Um, so Dave asked, what percentage of red wines undergo malolactic fermentation? Uh, depends on the region. Uh, in, For example, in California, in Napa, it's pretty much done to every single wine. Uh, it's just a given that that's part of the process uh, because the American palate is more suited to like or more trained to enjoy like bigger, bolder and softer and rounder, more plush kind of like flavors. Uh, so in Europe, it's not as, as common. Uh, for example, in Burgundy, they almost never do it. Uh, so malolactic is not very common in places like Burgundy when they're doing Pinot Noir. Uh, Italy as well. It's a choice at this point. And we kind of find this in a lot of places in Europe in general. They're sort of uh, at a crossroads right now. They're stuck with tradition and they want to hold on to uh, the traditions that serve them well. And of course, they're also um, very proud of their traditions. So they have one foot in the old world, but they also are selling wines to people who live and exist in this world that we live in now. And it's more of a global palate where people are used to tasting things from around the world. So they're trying to satisfy both of those needs at the same time. Uh, so you're seeing this particularly in Brunello too. You have this old school where they used to make these wines that spent a lot of time aging in oak and had to be bottled and sat in the cellar for eight for years and years and really couldn't be consumed or enjoyed for decades. But people don't have that kind of time anymore. Consumers don't want to wait. They want to drink their wines right away. Um, and also the wineries want to make money quicker than they used to as well, too. They have to keep, you know, to pay the bills. So um, they're coming up with this newer style of Brunello like this, where it's a little bit more easy to consume at a younger age. Uh, so they're kind of putting their feet in, in both worlds. Uh, so malolactic is also more of a new world treatment. And um, some wineries are doing it. So it's a choice that you're seeing. Um, the first one that we had tonight did not undergo malolactic fermentation. The second one did. So these winemakers are making conscious choices. Do I want to make more of an old world wine or do I want to make more of a new world style? So I don't know. I, I couldn't give you a specific percentage. Um, but if I had to just like kind of like spitball it, I guess in Italy, I would say in this region, 25% of people are doing malolactic fermentation. Uh, you know, this, it's still kind of, considered to be progressive and not traditional. So if they're going more traditional and old school, no malolactic. Michelle also said that the that a portobello mushroom pizza would be really yummy with the swine. Oh yeah. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm hungry too. I haven't eaten. So <laughs> <laughs> pretty much anything sounds good at this point. <laughs> uh yeah, um, so there's uh, one dish. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this before. I just learned about it today. Has anybody here heard of peposo before? No? Um, nope. Here, let me, let me share my screen real quick. I just learned about this today. And I consider myself to be pretty food savvy, too. Um but it's supposed to be, it's a staple of the region and it's supposed to be amazing with Brunello. And it's just four ingredients or five ingredients. It's beef chuck, um, olive oil, garlic, salt, and a ton of black pepper. So it's basically pepper steak and, oh, I'm sorry, five ingredients and a bottle of Chianti or anything with Sangiovese in it. And you just pour that in there and you let it marinate. You let it um, braise for about three hours. That looks, uh, that looks incredible. <laughs> I, I can taste it just by looking at it. Yes. I'm totally making this. I mean, when I was in Tuscany, I learned that there was a bolognese recipe that I got from one of the winemakers there. We still use that to this day. We still make that recipe. Uh, this I'd never heard of before, but now I'm totally all about this. And I mean, like I can just imagine, you know, if you're braising it for three hours, it's probably just like fall apart on your fork. And it's just really i think the uh, recipe that i read was something like two tablespoons of pepper black pepper so oh, it's wow. really peppery <laughs> but yes that's called peposo and i think i uh, grabbed the link if you guys want a, a recipe let me uh, grab it from the browser here real quick Okay.
All right, there's your proposal recipe. How do we upgrade this WTSO service to where we get to eat the food along with the wine? <laughs> <laughs> there's a I know, man. Opportunity there. We need white glove food delivery to each of us, right? <laughs> we'll put it in the suggestion box. Okay. I, actually, I think we need to have a uh, a group reunion somewhere in Italy. Mark, put that together. Yeah. <laughs> I'll Why see what I can do. <laughs> I was uh, I was scheduled to do a cruise this year. It got postponed, unfortunately, but we were doing one down the road. Um, so yeah, I I was kind of on the way to towards doing that. Um, yeah, we need to rent like a Tuscan village somewhere. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> How much would it cost if we divided it among 31 people? <laughs> We'd have half a plane filled, pretty much. <laughs> we're yeah, we're doing a cruise. We're doing a cruise this summer from Venice through Croatia, down around uh, Sicily, and back up to Rome. And uh, I. I I've had some wines from Croatia. I, I don't know if you've tried those before yet, not Mark or not, but uh, they've been, they were pretty interesting too. Yeah, I've had a few um, from that region in general. I would love for um, us to be able to get some through WTSO, but they're very hard to get a hold of. And typically uh, they're not everybody's cup of tea. So uh, that's a little difficult, but I would love to do something like that and cover those sometime. I'll, there's some great Hungarian ones. Um, I've been drinking some stuff from Estonia as well and Georgia too. Uh, but yeah, Croatia. I don't know if I've told you guys this before, but when I was growing up, my dad, before um, 23andMe and genealogy.com existed, uh, the only thing you could do really was call people up on the phone and find out where you came from, talk to old relatives. So uh, he thought we were German at one point. So he traced our name to Z-U-P-Z-I-G and he thought we were German. Um, but it turns out that he went down the wrong path all those years. And uh, when he finally made it to Croatia, he started to find people with my last name, Supsic, everywhere. So I, I think we're probably Croatian and I didn't know it all this time. So yeah, I have uh, roots in Croatia and I would love to go there one day. And you know yeah. that from previous wine tastings that we've done as well, too, that uh, Croatia is the home of Zinfandel. So the Zinfandel grape that we drink oh. in California now came to mm -hmm. us by way of Southern Italy from Puglia on the heel of the boot. And it went to Italy from Croatia where it was called Kroshinac Castellansky at one point. So um, yeah, I would like to go back and uh, to meet some of my family members and drink some uh, Kroshinac Castellansky. <laughs> I'm jealous. That sounds like an amazing cruise, Robert. If we hey, go Mark. to Tuscany, we need a villa. <laughs> Big villa. Mark, you need uh, a, you're like a 30 person yeah. villa. <laughs> well, while WTSO may not be able to get Croatian wine, uh, I will give them a plug. They have some great Brunellos. Uh, I had just ordered a case probably a week before this month's wine selection came in. Uh, so there's, there's at, at least four maybe six different wines, uh, Brunellos, mm -hmm. and they're all in the 29 to $39 range. And uh, so far, every one I've had has been outstanding. So a uh, little plug for WTSO. Thanks. We're, we're Good really point, happy to Nick. do that. Good point. If anybody needs <laughs> any, let me know. No, we have a good. lot of Italian wines. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know you guys kind of go through waves where you, you know, Sometimes it'll be France. Sometimes it'll mm -hmm. be Spain. Yeah, you're you're kind of in an Italy phase right now. Yeah, it depends on what we, we can get our hands on, right? Mm. Exactly. Have we done Amarons for uh, the wine premium wine club? Yeah, we did. Yeah, okay. well, that must have been yeah. before I was part of it. Must have been yeah, early, very not. early on. It was, um, and they were fabulous. Yeah. Gosh, you know, it was, yeah. if I had to guess, I would say it was probably oh. early on because we started in September of 2022 and yeah. it might've been like around December yeah. of 2022. It was earlier than that. part of this from the beginning. I don't it remember. Was it yeah. was earlier. 
Was it? Bottles from that selection that are waiting for us to drink. It was very good. <laughs> yes. Ours never yeah. was that. The first December was champagne. So I want to say it was October. Yeah. Yeah. You might be right. <laughs> Yeah, um, I always remember everything in terms of the videos that I shot. And I remember I shot videos with a Christmas tree in the background. So yeah, it was sometime around that that time of year. Uh, yeah, but we did do Amaronis and uh, there's mm -hmm. always room for more Amaroni. I love it. There were some um, Italians too on our case sale that's still going on right now. Um, it's till midnight. Today's the third day. Um, if you want to keep your eye out on there. Amaroni was fantastic. And then we have the the bottle shop is open again for yeah, the that's... subscription wines. I just put that link in the chat. Yeah, that's something cool that that uh, WTSO started this year that I was uh, happy to be a part of as well too. So it's um, all the wines that we've tasted in prior sets over the past year and a half that we've been doing this or so. Yeah. Uh, you can go if you're not a member of the club. You know somebody who'd be interested in trying this, and they're not really kind of like. You know, they're not sure if they want to be a part of the club yet. They can go back and they can try any of the wines that we've had in the past and you can buy them individually, bottle by bottle. And uh, you can taste them. Uh, it's, what is it, $60 or more? You get free shipping? Yeah. 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 And 10% more off of that if you buy more than six bottles, right? Did I get that right? I believe so. Okay, We're cool. running all different promos. <laughs> yeah, there's so many, uh, so many different deals. But yeah, if you know somebody who'd be interested in doing this, but they're not quite ready to commit to the club, uh, they can buy individual bottles through the bottle shop and you can even schedule your own tasting with me now too. So you don't have to do these. Mark? If you um, just can't get enough of me. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> Mark we, did, we did Portugal and we did Chile and Argentina. Yes. But I don't think we've done Spain yet. Did we do Spain? I feel like we did last year. Yeah, I think we did. I think we Spain? did. We did, yeah. we did Spain, yeah. Yeah. yeah when I think Spain. Spain, I think Rioja, and I know we haven't done a Rioja. No, no. You know what we did? Um, you we did, did Portugal. You didn't do Spain. I believe, well, you know, I mean, I've done Spain. so many of these. I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was like four wines from the northern part of Spain. Uh, and it was like a mix from all over the place. But you may be right. I don't know, Mary. Um, yeah, I mean, after drinking all this wine, sometimes my memory, my brain ain't so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did we did some Spain, but I was dying to do the Riviera del Doro, and, and we haven't done that yet. But uh, the other thing I was thinking, too, is I would love to see uh, more Australia and New Zealand. We yes. haven't done any New Zealand at all. Um, and I, I think New Zealand is a wonderful place to explore, especially their Pinot Noir. So we carried would... a bunch of um, New Zealand and Australian wines when I first started like 10 years ago. But um, very limited right now, though. Yeah, because one of my favorite wines I found was the Brancat Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. Yeah, it's a, a lot of it's <laughs> driven by the economy and the supply chains, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you got to go wherever you can get the most. Um, so I don't think, you know, maybe a lot of people who aren't in this business, they don't understand. Um, oftentimes when you ship or when you order, oh, it's know. it's all about what you can fill up a container on a ship with or like pallets. Uh, so sometimes you have to order from places around the world where you can fill a container or you can fill an entire pallet of wine with. Uh, so it's a, it's a decision that's economical as well. This would go after the stairs. Yeah, what it is, honey, it's one on eight, so... Yeah. yeah, so sometimes you wind up having to order from places uh, just by based on economics. Hey, Mark, could you briefly describe uh, the derivation of Super Tuscans and what that's all about and what's different about those wines versus yeah, Brunello's and the, the Sangioveses? Yes, yeah. uh, definitely. As a matter of fact, um, there's a region in this in the Montalcino area uh, called Sant'Antimo, which is also like a similar uh, Super Tuscan region. Uh, so the story goes that um, originally in the Chianti region, the quality of the Chianti wines was suffering 
around, they were being mass produced around the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And the quality of Chianti was so bad that I think they coined the phrase fiasco, uh, as, you know, uh, the flask, that straw flask that the wine used to come in. Um, that's where the term fiasco comes from, supposedly, uh, because the wine was so bad that it was just a, a total failure. Um, so the quality of Chianti was getting so bad at the 40s and the 50s. Uh, it was being mass produced because a lot of American GIs that were stationed in Italy were discovering this Italian wine called Chianti and they were taking it back to the United States. Uh, so suddenly Italy found this huge thirst for Chianti wines in the, the post-World War II boom where they were mass producing it and the quality really dropped a lot. Uh, there was a small cast of winemakers in the Tuscany region uh, that didn't want, they refused to produce inferior wines. So they decided that they were going to step out of the system, the normal wine, uh, the rules and regulations of the region, and they were going to start using French grapes in their wines. Uh, so they started using uh, wines, the grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And it believed it started with wines uh, for those of you connoisseurs and collectors out there. Uh, Sasakaya, I believe, was the first one. Uh, Tignanello was another one. Uh, so those are the famous sort of cult collector's wines to this day uh, that come from the Tuscan region. And they're made with Sangiovese, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's a blend of French and Italian grapes. Uh, they don't fit within the rules and regulations of the wine system in, in uh, Tuscany. So they had to come up with a second classification or a third classification for these wines. Uh, they called it IGT, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. So it was a classification unto itself that didn't fit into the normal nomenclature, the normal classification systems in this region. Uh, IGTs are all over the, uh, the country of Italy at this point, And they're usually designated for any region or any winemakers who don't want to adhere to the traditional system. Uh, so this Santa Antima is another one of them that you're going to find in the Brunello, in the uh, Montalcino region. That's an IGT, and they're using Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot as well. So they're making super Tuscans. Uh, they call them super Tuscans because they're Tuscan wines, but they're beefed up with a little bit of extra super juice in there. Uh, so French grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot typically. Sometimes Malbec as well, too. Some of the blends will use Malbec, uh, but they call those wines super Tuscans because it's sort of like a Tuscan wine on steroids. And uh, it's usually a very heavy, deep red wine, uh, has a long age bill, a long um, potential for aging, and uh, collectors love them, and they usually command a very high price. Uh, I've never come across a Sant Antimo before, so I don't know if anybody in this group has one or if they've ever tasted one before, but that would be the Montalcino equivalent of a super Tuscan wine. Old world, new world comparison too. That's a great idea. I would love to see something like that. So you can see the difference. We can display the difference. So years ago, before we started Premium Wine Club, I was doing something called weekly tasting. <laughs> and... Uh, those were monthly sets or bi-monthly sets that we would do um, different themes and we, it would be the themes of our choosing. And I think we we did a couple of old world, new world comparisons yeah. back then, but we haven't done any since then. So that would be a really a great exploration uh, to take people in this group on. Taste old world uh, French Pinot Noir, for example, against California, Oregon or Washington Pinot Noir. Uh, taste French Cabernet Sauvignon versus Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, Italy is a little bit more of a challenge because a lot of the grapes that are used in Italy stayed in that country. Uh, there is some Sangiovese and um, there's some Nebi uh, Nebbiolo being grown in California, but not that much and probably not to the point where we'd be able to get our hands on it. Um, so yeah, it would probably be more of a French or a Spanish comparison that would be feasible. But that's a great all idea. These, all of these suggestions I'm um, jotting down to you so we can re uh, revisit them when we, when we talk for the next few uh, tastings. Fantastic. Yeah, I love this feedback and this uh, all the input here. Can, um, can you also, I'm sorry, Mark, can you also okay. 
right down the Lang region of Italy. Um, mm. I wrote a bunch of things about that, that it's a really a good value, good, really good wine. Um, you know, it's skipped over by some of the other regions, but um, produces some really good wine and some great value. So when you go to a restaurant and you're looking for a Nebbiola or something like that, the Lang region stands out as being super but actually is is uh, less expensive than some of the other ones. Yeah, usually when you're looking at the northwestern corner of Italy like that, you're thinking Barolo. That's what everybody thinks. Barolo or Gattinara, typically, um, or even Dolcetto. But uh, yeah, you're not really thinking like sort of like more budget-friendly Nebbiolo wines. And uh, Lange, uh, just L-A-N-G-H-E is the name of the region up there. And uh, you can get some really nice high quality nebbiolo based wines that don't command a high price because people don't know what they are that's a great suggestion are there I mean, any other regions or other places that everyone is interested in i saw the zin um just so for future reference it wouldn't be would be good to see what everyone's interested in learning more about yeah i agree Yep. We're always trying to uh, keep our ear to the ground for you guys. And, you know, of course, like I said, sometimes it's a, it's a matter of logistics. Uh, it's what you can get from what part of the world. And oftentimes there are rules that you have to follow, like you have to fill up a container or get a full pallet of wine, too. So um, there's it's like a matrix of different things that need to be met in order to be able to procure some of these wines. So we always do our best or, that, you know, WTSO always does their best to procure these wines for you, but it's not always possible. Mark, how far out are you guys planning these or is it sort of a get together and the next month we do this? Um, we try to do two to three months out, um, but, you know, depending on the ebb and flow of logistics and shipping, uh, sometimes we could be like, right, you know, like on the... Um, the ball of our ass sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 so you know always whenever possible we try to make sure we have as much buffer as possible but yeah there's always like a an ebb and flow where we get to the point where we're you know we're like kind of on the edge of our seats for a month or two. You, <laughs> and i would suggest australia and tasmania well tasmania tasmania would be a, that's an interesting ask um, I didn't even wines. know they produced wines. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, produce very wines. nice wines. Everywhere it produces wine. <laughs> Not true. necessarily good wine, but everywhere <laughs> produces wine. Yeah, very true. <laughs> yeah, um, Canary Islands would be a good exploration, but I, I mean, trying to get wines from Canary Islands would be almost impossible. Um, Germany, you know, we we really haven't done Germany, and Germany is relatively accessible. Germany Mark, and I have, Austria. I have to tell you, I hunt down the uh, YouTube channel for your name so that I jump on whatever the next month is. I figure he's going to put something out. It's going to be a teaser. Let me jump on it and see what it is. <laughs> I well, love your you. videos. I love your videos. Oh, thank you, Mary. My one fan. Yes. <laughs> you have more than one. <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, I've reached a milestone a couple of weeks ago. I crossed over 2.5 million views on my channel. So, uh, yeah, I would say there are some people watching the channel. It's and it's only picking up steam. So, thank you everybody for all of your support. It, uh, you know, off as a tangent, uh, thank you everybody who watches the videos, and thank you for all the people who support uh, that piece of it too. Um, those are fun, and I have to pinch myself a lot of times because I can't believe that th this is my job. I get paid yeah. to do this. <laughs> we love so, it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm ever appreciative to WTSO, everybody there who believes in me and who allows me to do this too. So, Mark, that's so, yeah. a good segue to give everybody an idea where we're going next month. Yes. <laughs> um, you may know this if you're club members and you, you received your, have they received their delivery yet? Mm, we don't get ours until the first part of the month. Yeah. The first. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, next month we are going to the Willamette, damn it, the Willamette Valley of uh, Oregon, and we're going to drink nice. some Pinot Noir. Yes. Yeah. And then after that, we are doing uh, French Chenin Blanc. Ooh. 
And um, you know, I think we're out. We have another month after that, but I'm not sure what that is. Do you know, Bree? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, shit and blow up I believe on. we're trying to get Luca. Why? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so you guys remember we did a couple of months ago, we did a tasting Again? with uh, Dr. Laura Katina. Yeah, but she's got some other stuff uh, that we haven't tasted yet, including some Malbecs. And uh, I think one of them is a reserve, too. So, yeah, uh, that's in the works right now. That's why Mark, I, I missed that video. I mean, that live video. And I really wanted to see this woman talk about her wines. And I don't know what happened that night, but I missed it. And oh, man, yeah, she's I'm so looking nice. Forward. I'm looking forward to her coming back. Yeah, she is like an icon, and uh, she joined us from the airport that night. Yeah, and she, she, yeah, she's an icon in the business. The Katana family has been there since the 1920s, and they're like uh, royalty for Mendoza wines. So having her on was a privilege and honor. And uh, she's also really so well spoken and nice and knowledgeable too. So it was just a pleasure to listen to her and have her uh, attend. So hopefully, maybe we can get her back on too. I could literally listen to her all day. She was she was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's just good energy all around and a good person to uh to learn from. And she has her hands in so many different things too. <laughs> yeah, she was a medical doctor. That was her yeah. job. Um, so she had a medical practice in San Francisco before she went back home and started doing wine full time. All right, let me um you know, let's do the favorite. I mean, the um, standard poll here. I want to see what you thought about the wines tonight. And there's no wrong answer, obviously. Yeah, I figured this one would probably be close to an even split. I'll say this is neck and neck. <laughs> yeah, both of them are good for different reasons. I think this may have been the hardest call, Mark. You know, <laughs> it's either either one, it could have gone either way. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. This one was almost like flip the coin. Uh, how were you and Stacy? Were you guys split on it or did you both agree? Um, I, I think we both agreed that it was hard to say. Like the first one was, um, it felt a little bit more rough around the edges and, but had a lot of interesting flavors and a lot of fun going on in there. The second one was a little bit more well-rounded and, and so was a little bit more pleasant, but pleasant isn't always what you're looking for in a glass of wine. And so it, it, they, I think someone said it earlier that they were very different. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think they both had a lot of strengths and not a lot of cons. But the, but the first one was in the new glasses, so I might give it not to the first one. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. The first one was in the new glass. All right, let me uh, share the results here. This was pretty much a 50-50 split with the uh, Celestino Pecci doing a little better than the Legode. But I I agree with Todd and Stacy. I think it's a hard call to make. Um, I happen to love wines, all wines for different reasons, and I think it's a matter of um, you know where you're at, what mood you're in, what you need that night. You know, some nights you just want to watch um, Top Chef on TV, and some nights you want to watch uh, Succession, and you really want to be challenged a little bit. You know, it depends on where you're at mentally and physically, and uh, what mood you're in. Yeah, I, have different they, they were very different, but it was still hard to to answer that question. I thought it was a bit of a like a Pepsi challenge for those that are old enough to remember. <laughs> where the, the Celestino seemed like a little bit more approachable and interesting, like immediately with that cola and cinnamon and cocoa kind of flavor. But the Lagode, maybe you might like to drink it more over the long term. Yeah, I mean, a little different, but I I kind of felt like it had that quality. In, in the comparison. I'd like Mark, to taste them. Please. I'd like to taste them again in reverse order. Oh, yeah. We're not needed. Uh, Mark, it was it was interesting when Risa first tasted the Lagoda. 
um, I didn't, I didn't <clears throat> really care for she, it. She, I didn't think she would drink anymore. She no, really did a, not like it. Both the nose and the taste were, were really? not. I think it got better as and I drank it. To the point where no, when I she voted, that, that was her, that her favorite. Yeah. So as it opened up, it really... It was more interesting. Yeah, it was, nice. it was great. Great yeah. wine. Mm -hmm. and, and we had it aerated for 24 we had, hours yeah, we had so, it aerated since yesterday. Um, and yet it still opened up that much more when it was in yeah. the glass how many glasses did it take <laughs> well, 12 but you know that's beside the point we bought a whole case you know <laughs> i had a similar feeling it, it uh, took just, a while it yeah. Yeah. but it did it get to get better <laughs> Well, I think there's been scientific studies before that that show that you know if you're in a bad mood, uh, things taste worse too. So hopefully nobody's in a bad mood here tonight. But you know your mood definitely and your 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 where your head is at definitely affects the way you perceive the world and the way you taste things as well too. Uh, and sometimes things just grow on you too. That's one of the things I was trying to articulate earlier. Is you know when you get older, as I think most of us here are. Um, you um, realize that nothing in life is easy and sometimes it takes a lot of thinking and so a little bit of wisdom to appreciate some things in life. Uh, and these are those kinds of wines. Uh, in Italy, they call those the Vina de, Vina de Meditazione, wines of meditation. So you have to meditate on them. You have mm -hmm. to think about them. This is the kind of wine you just kind of sit with in, you know, in what a comfortable chair or a couch somewhere and just kind of like think about it and think about life and how wonderful it is. <laughs> Hopefully. I think we could drink these wines without food. Um, especially well, you know, it's um, every time we do these, I always think to myself, yeah, I'm going to try and keep it brief tonight, <laughs> but there's always so much to say, you know, and uh, it's, I love that we talk about these and we pull these things apart and we, that you ask questions and we really kind of dig, dig here. So, yeah. Does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts before? I, I, I agree with that. I enjoy the wine so much more with the conversation. It is. It's really just like having a group of friends get together and, you know, we could talk about other things, but then we'd probably be here till, till midnight or so. <laughs> you want to, <laughs> yeah, you want to start bringing in other topics and other, and other issues to discuss um, but yeah, just for two wines to to take us the distance of an hour and a half or even longer says a lot. So these are really wonderful wines. They're very complex and it, it helps to have a little bit of knowledge behind them as well, too. Cool. So are we good? Does, uh, we know where we're going in the next couple of months. Uh, we know where we've been. You know that you can buy some of these wines and taste them again and keep them for your collection in your cellar if you want to. Uh, yeah, I think we've covered a lot of ground tonight. So thank I you so much. Fact, I love the fact that they're available after the fact. I really love that I, that part of this. Yeah, well, that was one of the things we, we discussed early on is because some of these were kind of, you know, when we were, we were serving them to you, um, people were asking me like, I wonder how these would taste in a couple of years. You know, there's no way of knowing unless you have more. So this way you can actually buy multiple copies or you can go back and you can revisit. You can see how they're doing. For example, um, we had two Santa Millions that we did a year ago. And uh, they've changed significantly in the last year. So last year we did a Santa Million tasting from France, from the, the left bank of Bordeaux. And uh, we just revisited them this year. They're still available for purchase. And they're even better than they were before. So now you can go back and you can check those out and revisit those. I keep waiting for the groth to come back, but I noticed she hasn't <laughs> put that up. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Bree. Do you I guys still have any of that? Let me see. That was so good. Oh, yeah, it was that, excellent. Yeah, I feel are, like I haven't seen that in forever. I, know, I don't think we have. No, we're out. We're out. Yeah. yeah. Dennis Froth is a great winemaker. Yeah, and I believe, was that a 2016 or was that a 2011? Um, we had, I, I, think, I, think I think it was 15. 15. 15? We had a 15, a 16, a 2010, and a 2008 at one point. Wow. 
Yeah, th those are fantastic wines. Those are the kind of wines you dream about. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Lisa bought the bought the uh, the last of them. <laughs> oh my goodness, Lisa! <laughs> again, guilty, guilty. <laughs> Hey, Mark, have you ever had a good grappa? No. <laughs> I didn't what? think so. Good. Grappa. Um, it's one of those things, I think, you know, so we, were, we were talking about, like, you kind of kind of get your head around it. You have to think about it a little bit. And uh, you're not always in the mood to do that kind of work, you know? I mean, like, sometimes you just want something that doesn't require a lot of work. For me, grappa takes a lot of work to enjoy. Um, I've had some really bad ones, but I've had a couple of good ones. Um, when Michelle and I were in the, um, the Long Gate Bridge and we went to the Cinque Terre uh, years ago, uh, we visited a winery. Um, it was called Terra Bianchi, uh, White Earth. And almost every winery in Italy uses their, their grapes, their, the mark from their pressed grapes to create grappa as well, too. So almost every winery that you go to in Italy is also going to serve a grappa. And they had an oak-aged grappa there, and it was very expensive. It was like $100 a bottle. Wow. But it was probably the only grappa I've ever had before uh, that I really enjoyed. And part of that might have been because I paid $100. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that escalation of commitment, you know? You, the deeper in you get, the better it tastes. Yes, and that was not a suggestion to do that as a, a wine um, for the month. No, 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 <laughs> I agree. No, I've no, no, no. never had a good one. <laughs> no, you know, yeah, grappa is a tough sell, man. It's one of those um, years ago when I started my wine channel on YouTube, I used to do just, uh, a series called Tales from the Cabinet. And it was all about pulling out like the stuff that sits in your liquor cabinet and nobody drinks. Uh, all the things that you think that you're going to drink and things that people buy you for gifts, the things people bring back from vacation. Uh, so it was all those rare and odd things like Rocky from Greece and Grappa from Italy. And I used to do a series about that. But yeah, that's the kind of thing that just kind of sits in your cabinet. And you're like, eh, I don't know when I'm going to come around to this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you. And I agree with Scott. Uh, the company is what makes it all the better. And drinking these wines together is is always so much fun. So I'm glad that month after month we get to come together and join each other. And it's uh, consistently successful and, and a decent group of people who are really engaged and love wine and love learning about it, too. So I, I thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Course, yeah, thank you, Brie. Thank you to Ed, too. Nice job. Thank you, WTSO, for putting thank this you, on. Thank you, WTSO. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, Good night, everybody. guys. Cheers. Happy Thanks. holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I'll see everybody next month. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao.